What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the MulletCast, the podcast where business and pleasure collide. My name is Evan Balmer. Follow me on Instagram at Evan Balmer. Our guest today is Jim Garcia. Jim hey. is the uh, bassist and vocalist yep. for New Jersey Institution, not just limited to New Jersey, but you know, a, a true institution, uh, the band The Nerds. What's going on, Jim? Nothing. It's just uh, this is the first uh, podcast thing I've ever done. That's insane. Um, because the nerds have been around for quite a long time. By the way, follow the nerds on Instagram at the nerds band and uh, check out their website at the dash nerds dot com. Um, how long have you guys been around? This summer marked our thirty fourth year. I thought that's what I, I was doing the math. I came up with thirty two years. Obviously, I wasn't a math major, but. <laughs> So I can't add, apparently, but it, it almost didn't seem like possible. Um, that's, a, I mean, that's quite a career. It is. And the, the, the interesting thing about it, from a personal note, is that, to th you know, nobody planned on this. We, we did this as a, as a joke. Right. And after a couple of months of doing it, we started kind of generating a following. And so then it was like, all right, we'll do this for a while. Mm -hmm. Never in, never did anybody think it would go 10 years, 15, 20, 34 years. Right. But what happens in that time is that you grow up. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. you know, it's one thing if you have a job for two or three years. You don't know, you're pretty much in one place in your life. Right. But in 34 years, you know, you're, you're playing in a band in a club. And then afterwards, you're going to a diner until three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning, and right. then you're getting home. And and then then you meet somebody, and then you marry somebody, then you have kids, and then you own a house, and then all, this, and you look back and you go, oh my god, I just spent my entire adulthood right. playing in a band, and as our as my only thing that I do right. for a career, and that <laughs> that's where you, if you think about it. You know, if I think about it, right. I have to stop thinking about it. It's right. like, no, 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 this, this, this is just the way it played out. Yeah. You know? and, uh, Which is interesting on many levels because, one, you know, most musicians, that kind of should be your goal, right? If this is what I love to do, I want to do this for, you know, what better gift than to be able to do that for a living, right? right? And then the other crazy thing is, in a lot of ways, most of your audience like you guys have grown up and done all these things but in a weird way your audience almost has never changed right <laughs> if yeah. you're i mean i know yeah. you do have like older fans that you encounter in different places but right. if you look at like your traditional like summer gigs probably it looks like those people never age right because right. every year it's new yeah. 21 22 23 and, right? and the funny thing is too <laughs> you know along the way you be you actually befriend a lot of people not right. just fans but you befriend some people because you see them coming out again and again uh -huh. now you're you know you're sharing a beer or you're talking then they're inviting you to a thing right. so you go to that and you get to know them a little bit and then suddenly you don't see them anymore mm. and it's like oh, what happened to the silly boys, these right. bunch of guys from uh, Marlboro. Right. Oh, well, you know, they got married. They, they got a life going. This <laughs> right. one's a lawyer now, and this one's a realtor, and this uh -huh. one. And it's just like, oh. And then you look around, and then you notice, oh, here's another. Here's a new batch of silly boys right. over here. <laughs> That's right. Or here's a new bunch of, this is this year's model of this. Right. And it's just, it's just, it's be, it's more than the, all right, so playing and doing that for a living mm. is a remarkable privilege sure. it's a privilege right. because you get to be the guy that makes a whole bunch of people have a really fun time for a couple of hours and right. then go off into their life but I lost my train of thought mm. no <laughs> <laughs> but when you start marking time right uh, you know based on who's coming out that's when it's like wow yeah we, we've seen some things go by I even even it. our road crew we've we've had over 140 people i was wondering about that yeah work for the nerds wow. in one form or another mm. on the road right and uh, we've only had one member change in 34 years that's and that's nuts. because the first guy passed away right so uh yeah wow time just yeah. trickles by it is crazy so what have you noticed about like that age group of fans like what's changed over the years if anything are they all pretty similar Basically, coming out that good. They're time. all pretty similar because if they've if they've bothered to walk through the door, mm -hmm. walk through the door to see a live band, right. there's already a certain mindset or a certain expectation. However, there have been a lot of clubs that we've played where the majority of the people are there because of the DJ. They mm -hmm. want to hear, you know, right. they want to hear that. They don't want to think about music. 
and then we'll play, and then some some guy will come up and say, hey, you know something, I I never really cared about bands, but you guys, you know, you got something going on, you know. <laughs> and it's like, wow, you never cared about bands. Well, you know, right. you don't, you want to say, well, who, who do you think made all this music? Right, right. <laughs> you know, it's like saying, well, you know, I never really cared about food, but this is delicious. Right. <laughs> so that's pretty crazy because, right, not only – have you aged and everything and trends come and go like not just in the world but musical trends mm -hmm. right and you guys have survived all of that as well yeah, which yeah. is interesting you always have to you know you always have to take a, do a little bit of something that's newer mm -hmm. not even new but newer right just to just so that people don't feel turned off i i won't name names but i saw a lot of bands growing up right where i'd go see them and they played this this music here they never went beyond this year and after a while it was like Okay, this is this is my this is history now. This right. is a history lesson. This is not contemporary. Gotcha. So we always tried to make it a point to, as, in as much as most of our music is classic rock, mm -hmm. or funk, or you know, did some disco song, you know, we'll, we'll we'll do something new so that the so that the new fan, the young fan, will look at that and say, okay, I can relate to this. I'll pay attention for the next twelve minutes. Right. And uh, the oh, the other interesting thing is that in that time in that time period you know we've had people who were 20 years old 21 years old when they first saw us mm -hmm. they grew up they had families now their kids come out to see right. us and that's a weird thing because for a while it was just like oh my mother talked about you guys all the time and then and it would be like oh that's yeah you feel slighted like right. oh no i'm the old man in the, in the room now yep. but then it became the parents actually bringing them to see us play, for instance, like a Joe Pops because they're down there for the week. Right. And, oh, my God, my dad's been talking about you guys for, like, all my life, and now here we are. Right. And it's them and their parents. And when do you see that? Yeah. Other than a, you know, family reunion or not even a wedding. So right. The, the teens, they don't go to that stuff like that. Right, totally. So it's really cool to see that. Yeah. And you see, like, now you're a common thing between these generations in the same family. Right. It's, it's, That's it's really, really cool. something. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, my first nerd show, I want to say, was Memorial Day in Belmar. I was, like, 21. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at that time of my life, like, it honestly was, like, an occasion where, like, your your reputation was already kind of, you know, was big. and But it was, like, that was the official start of summer. It's, like, you saw the nerds, and then mm -hmm. summer was, like, officially underway. Right, you know? right. And then you guys were obviously playing everywhere all summer long. Um, so that's pretty cool, and yeah. you're still doing it. Obviously, and we're still doing it. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, I'm 23 now, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all? Aren't we all 23 yeah, totally. now for in our in our dreams? All right, totally. <coughs> I uh, well, most most of our summer is at the Jersey Shore right. because that's where the people are. Yep. But uh, the rest of the year, we're playing three or four nights a week all over the place, right. and, and flying out to California, and Texas, or whatever, yep. doing corporate events. A lot of fundraisers and stuff. That's that's a neat thing that that's kind of cool. come into our realm right. is fundraisers, uh, and and of course weddings that we've been doing forever. Even though people come up and always ask, us, uh, "Do you guys do weddings?" I'm like, yeah, we've done about five hundred and sixty right. of them. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's pretty wild. So, how did you get into music? Like growing up, when did you start playing? What were you listening to? That kind of stuff. Well, I. Uh, I started, I guess I started, I took lessons when I was about six. Mm -hmm. And like most kids who take lessons when they're six, then they stop immediately because they don't want to practice. Right. What were you playing? Uh, guitar. Okay. And wow. then uh, when I was about 14, some friends of mine from uh, high school uh, said, you know, we have a bit, we need a bass player. And I'm like, well, what's a bass player? I didn't even know what that was. Right. Uh, so then I became a bass player. And right. then I've been playing ever since. Nonstop. I've always been in a band since the age of 14. Wow. So that's insane. Overlapping. Musically, uh, I come from a Cuban family. Mm -hmm. So my father, my parents came over in 55. Wow. My father, in as much as he loved his mambo music that he, that he grew up with, right. he also wanted to be American, like most Cubans coming over at the time. Wanted, they wanted to eat hot dogs and play baseball and, and, you know, that. Right. So he got a lot of whether it was Frank Sinatra and Acting Cole or, you know, Stop in the Name of Love or stuff like that. Right. And then my and then I was listening to a lot of rock and roll. My sister, who was older than I, was listening to James Brown, Sly and the Family Stone, and all right. that really good funk R&B stuff. Yep. So I grew up in that. Okay. Was your 
uh, did your father play, or he was just a music fan? He he sang. Okay. He, he was a music fan. Right. Uh, he was just a hard worker, but, mm. but he sang. He liked. He loved to sing. So whenever he was in the basement working on something, he was singing along to his records. Oh, wow. Pretty That's neat. cool. Yeah. So did they come to New Jersey originally, or how yeah. Did, yeah, yeah, from Havana to Hoboken. Wow. No <laughs> way. That's why. Once one stop. Right. And then they stayed there forever. Really. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Have you been to Cuba? Not yet. No. Not Any yet. Desire. Oh, completely. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. I have a feeling that if uh, as if as soon as I step into town to Havana, there'll be some some part some piece of dna in the air that'll just fuse immediately trigger yeah, yeah. because uh, you know I, i've i've been to miami beach mm. south beach and the interesting thing was i went with my wife a few years ago and as i went into any store or a coffee shop or bodega or whatever it was they just assumed that i spoke spanish which i do right and and i and that was you know funny for me it was like wow this, this is this is not America. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's pretty wild. But yeah, I'd love to go back. I'd love to go, not back, but I've never seen it uh, to, to Cuba. Yeah. Even for two, three days, just, right. to, just to smell it, taste yeah. it. Yeah. That's <clears throat> amazing. Yeah. That's cool. So um, how, what was the progression from your high school band to the formation of the Nerds? It was not a lot of bands, actually. It may be about a half a dozen bands. Mm -hmm. and uh, And that was fun because I got to learn not just how to play and play different kinds of music because it was always a cover band and there was in a couple of original bands but uh, that was just an experience about, about, about people and learning how to work with people so some of the bands that I was in most many of them I was not the leader of and I would watch the leader and I watched what he did right and I watched what he did wrong right and uh, and it was a great lesson mm -hmm. and by, so by the time I got you know, we, we had the Nerds actually originally was an, uh, uh, an originals band right? called AKA. And that was going nowhere. But in the meantime, the, f the four guys who made up the, the band, we, uh, we were having fun playing together. And we started doing the Nerds, again, like I said, as a joke. But it was kind of like, well, if nothing else, this will tighten us up as a band. Right. And, uh, and then it just kind of went from there. Yeah. Uh, but it was... You know, I, I'm I'm the leader of that band always was, right? Uh, and that was just a great experience because it went from just a jokey band to this to a formal business, which we were formalized by like 1988, I think. Right. Uh, incorporated the whole thing, and then you know, oh, we're going to set up a profit sharing, okay, and then oh, you know, medical, okay, sure, you right. know, and we just, and then suddenly I was learning about business. Right. In that respect. And right. So, yeah, it's been <clears throat> an education. Yeah. I think that's a hard decision for bands early on is, and you, you've you said this before, but um, the difference between being a cover band and an original band, right? It's like, I want to be an original band. I want to play my own music, but I'm playing in front of, like, two people and making no money, right? right. And, Versus, and, and they're both bartenders. Right, <laughs> exactly. Or like I can go out and play for hours or an hour or whatever, play other people's music, be in front of like a you know five hundred people or something, mm -hmm. um, and get paid and make money and make make a living at it. It's was that an easy decision at the time, or were you still kind of like we're doing this to get get going, but we want to be in a I want to be an original artist. Honestly, I it, it was never that important to me yeah. because unless I'm the guy who wrote the songs, uh, I'm playing somebody else's music. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's true. Right, right. That's true. I never uh, thought of it that way. So, I mean, you know, uh, when you look at Frank Sinatra or any symphony orchestra, they are not original anythings. They're right. singing somebody else's stuff. Sure. Uh, I just enjoyed playing. And because I enjoyed playing so many different kinds of music, mm -hmm. you know, quick aside, my wife hates getting in the car with me and putting on the radio because I'll be listening to a salsa station, then I'll put on a country station for a while, then I'll put on some Indian music, wow. Arabic music, right. and then rock. And she's like, you just like too much different music. Mm -hmm. And then right. it makes your skin crawl sometimes. <laughs> but because I do like all different kinds of music, the, the cover band things seem like a, a good idea. Right. And because you get to perform, and I'm, I've always been a natural performer. Right. Uh, I can switch it on and I can switch it off, mm -hmm. you know, and so because of because of all that and because then we started having some success, right? 
that's when it became like, oh, we we can do this. Right. You know, yeah. it's hard to keep a band together if uh, a, a cover band together if nobody's making any money or if it's inconveniencing a lot of people. Totally. But it's actually in the in the case of us of our the nerds because it created such a lifestyle. It was everybody's still there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy to keep the same band together for all those years. It's nuts. It's crazy to keep any small company together. That's for true. Five years right. Because. Uh, you know, you learn really quick, or or you, or you die. That, you know, the assets that you have are is, is the confidence of the people that you're mm-hmm. working with, the, the mutual respect that you show. You may not have tremendous respect for each other, but at least you demonstrate it. Right. And pay them. <laughs> so right. If you have a small company, you want success. Respect everybody. Pay them. Mm-hmm. And and just always work. You know work harder than anybody else right and that's everybody works harder than the next guy as much as they can right and when we get on stage it's 150 percent or go home so at the at the time when the band was formed was the nerds persona was it tied to the revenge of the nerds movie or was it just actually uh the guy who was our who who, who came up with the idea mm-hmm. was was our manager also uh steve tarkanish and right. he came up to me and said why don't you put a band together okay he saw there was a sketch on Saturday Night Live with Bill Murray and, and uh, wow, she died. I forget her name now. Uh, anyway, uh, Lisa Lupner and something, something. Right. And they go into a radio station and there's, oh, we have a band called The Nerds. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, and we, we play nerd rock and this and that's the other. So he saw that sketch. And from that, oh, yeah. he said, you know. We were. I was at a barbecue at his house, and he's like, "Why don't you put a band together and call yourselves the Nerds, right. and play all black music, you know, because of the the contrast and the irony." Right. Said, well, we could do that, but we could also do just some of this old, some of these older songs. Now, at the time, it would, they didn't even call it classic rock. Right. At the time, right. 1985, it right. was just rock, rock that was there. Right. Uh, so that's what we did. We came out and we played some funk stuff but we played a lot of r&b mm-hmm. and then stupid and then we found you know let's play some stupid songs right you know uh secret agent man or this or that or the other stuff right. that's just like who, every, okay it's 1985 right every band that's out there is wearing some form of spandex yeah growing their hair really long this is the, the pre bon jovi era right and uh so it's all about that and we're coming out in just this terrible plaid on plaid, glasses, terrible hair. Right. And I sweat more than any human on the planet, right. uh, even more than Nixon on TV. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it was perfectly suited to be this less than attractive band right. that's just playing music that they love and playing it as well as it could, as as well as they could play it. Right. Uh, it just it was just a formula for success right. or failure. But you know, it it, it worked. <laughs> right. It worked in our favor. <laughs> but yeah, it was because of that sketch. So uh, we you know we got it rolling. And like I said before, you know after after about a year, I remember calling Steve, the manager, and saying, "Hey, you know we're getting a following." Mm-hmm. Right. And, and then you kind of developed personas. Yeah, for, yeah. For each member of the yeah. band. And that, and the other thing, the the persona thing was, we can't be nerds like. Urkel, mm. or even the nerds in the nerd movie, because right. that's really shticky. Right. You know, uh, even even you have to pardon me because I'm probably the only person in America who can't stand the Big Bang Theory. Right. And it's because it's little hack jokes, and, and then the, there's the laughter and the applause. And right. if it wasn't, there was no laugh track. I, that show would fail. So our goal was like we can't be that because that's going to get old really quick. Right. We have to be something else. And what we what we found that we had was a tremendous amount of sarcasm mm-hmm. and a tremendous amount of irreverence, and that was the nerd angle that we played. Right. Say the wrong thing at the wrong time, make somebody feel really uncomfortable, insult the club owner. Right. Tell people not to tip the bartenders because they have cocaine <laughs> habits. Right. And, you know, if you want to really help them, put the money in your pocket. Right. And it was that. That's right. what we did. And then we just kind of <laughs> refined that as right. we went along, just trying to come up with as snarky an, an attitude as we could right. without being hack. And then as we had older, as we had 
started doing public events with little kids and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And then it became, well, how do we still be that without being offensive or right. saying the wrong thing in front of kids? Got to lose the Coke jokes on those uh, yeah. days, right? So then it became, <laughs> then it became, well, what, what, how do we mask the funny mm. that only the adults are going to go, oh my God, I can't believe he just said that. And right. the little kids are going, mommy, what, what did he just mean by that? <laughs> right. So that's that's the game. That's gotcha. the game of that's the cool. nerd persona. Right. And then underlying it all, you obviously have to be good musicians. Otherwise, no one's going to come see you play. Exactly. So how much work were you putting into like rehearsing and those things at that time? We were rehearsing quite a bit, but we were also doing our, our keyboard player at the time was a uh, just an encyclopedia of music. Right. Like, even if he had only heard a song a couple of times but never played it, he could play right through it. And then he would, a lot of this would happen on stage. We learned a lot of songs on stage. Wow. Because people would say, oh, can you play Bohemian Rhapsody? Right. And this actually <laughs> happened. Right. And it's still in our set. Right. Uh, and we were like, uh, I don't know. I look at the keyboard player. Ed, can you? And he was like, uh, yeah, yeah, something like this. So we went ahead and played it. That's insane. Terribly. Right. But we played the whole thing with great commitment. Right. And when it was done, it was just a groundswell of applause. And afterwards we said, uh, Maybe we should learn this. Right. <laughs> so it took us three rehearsals to right. actually learn Bohemian Rhapsody, which we still do every single night. But yeah, we, we practiced quite a bit. Yeah. But again, a lot of it was just stuff that you'd heard so many times. That if somebody, you know, play One Way Out by the Omen Brothers. Oh, I know how that goes. It's like this. And mm. then it's like that. So like teaching each other. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of jobs were you guys all doing at the time? Aside I, from. I was doing construction. I, right. was, I had my own. A small construction company. I, mean, I did that with my father and a okay. bunch of other uh, guys. Uh, and uh, our guitarist was driving a limousine. Our right. drummer was refinishing furniture. Keyboard player was working at some shop in Greenwich Village. All right. That was it. <laughs> That's cool. And after two years, I stopped doing what I was doing because it became an occupational hazard where all the dust and everything. Right. And a year after that, everybody else quit their jobs. Wow. So early on, like now you gig year round and you're doing lots of stuff, but I imagine as you were getting started, it was more like summer intensive. Mm-mm. No, you were still like kind of year round? No, we were always year. We started on August 15th right. of, of 85. Okay. So we were already going into the fall. So we were getting a, a vertical, like mm-hmm. a, every Wednesday at a club in Denville, New right. Jersey called the Fireside. Right. <clears throat> so that became our Wednesday, and then eventually a Thursday. This has all happened within six months. They were doing every Thursday Wally's in Bergenfield. Right. So that was every Wednesday and Thursday right through the winter. Wow. And then the weekends were everything and anything. Right. Uh, at the time, you know, there were still a lot of the shore clubs opening on the weekends, whether it was the Trade Winds. Right. That was year-round. Jenkinson's eventually when we got into that mm-hmm. year-round headliner, year-round. Right. So we were playing all those clubs right through the winter. And then right. when the summer came, it was all about as much shore as possible. Yeah. Do you remember back then, I mean, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but you played some like insane venues. But back then, what was the biggest gig we, when you were like, man, we're, we're on to something and we made it? Was there like a particular club that was a big deal for you to get into? Probably yeah, probably the, the Trade Winds was probably one, yeah. of, the, one of the bigger ones. Uh, but you know, it, we, we had such a grassrootsy kind of approach. We right. were playing s- small places, big places, and uh, but yeah, the trade rooms was probably one of the bigger, right. the bigger rooms that we were playing. And yeah. then Joe Pops, right, down in Long Beach Island. We were doing that since like 1988. That's crazy. Yeah. So that was kind of neat. Uh, and then everything happened in 1991 when we played the Garden State Art Center. That's what it was called at the time. Right. Us, the Party Dolls, and the Grease Band. Wow. That was amazing because it was sold. Well, it wasn't sold out, but there were 6,000 people there. That's crazy. So I'll never forget. I will never, for as long as I live, never forget the feeling of walking out from the wings onto the stage right. and just hearing, <sighs> and I looked at my keyboard player. I was like, oh, my <laughs> God, what are we doing here? Right. Because the biggest thing that we were playing at that time was a uh, the trade winds and right. the headliner and stuff like right. that. Right. So that was a great feeling. Yep. A year later, we played Carnegie Hall. Right. And what was that like? That was the best. Yeah. That was sold out, 2,800 seats. That's insane. And uh, 
and a lot going on at the time. I was, I just, I was getting married, right? Like a month later, uh, God just had just gotten into a, a new house. So some of the other guys, a lot going on. And then we played Carnegie Hall in August, and right. it was just like, oh my God, that was like being like being going to a museum, and then suddenly you're one of the exhibits, right? Because you know the dressing room, there's all these pictures. And, all these great conductors and right. the Beatles and the Stones in Chicago and blah, 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 blah. and uh, that was fantastic and and what was cool about that too was that was also a learning experience because it's a union shop yep you couldn't touch anything no so everything that we just wanted to grab a guitar you couldn't do that right you had a signal to one of the guys like I want that now and hope that he was paying enough attention to get right. it to you so I had this big stand up bass and it was off the off to the wings and uh, we were just about to do a couple of rockabilly and big band things and I'm looking at the guy and, <laughs> and he's looking at me and I just walked over to the side and said you picked this massive thing up right. and dragged it out uh, I didn't know that you weren't supposed to do that so right. they were very upset they were also very upset that we had some video camera stuff oh, yeah. going on Totally. <laughs> and then the best was we play Late in the Evening by Paul Simon. It's like a conga line kind of a song. And I jump off the stage right. into the aisle, which all the ushers were telling people they couldn't be in the aisle. Right. I dragged people by the hand out onto the aisle, and we did a conga line up and down the no aisles. No way. And it, it was a very freeing moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the ushers were like, what do we uh, do? Outraged, and uh, I felt like an outlaw at that moment. That's nuts. <laughs> yeah, I was fortunate. I I had a opportunity to be with a client at Carnegie Hall. I was doing a gig there, and he plays piano. And he's on stage, taking like a selfie of himself with his piano on stage at Carnegie Hall. Sure. And like people came out of the woodworks, like freaked out, like basically tackling him. Like yeah. you know, you can't take pictures here because, like you said, Union House, and uh, it's nuts. And he was like so proud he wanted to send it to his mom in Japan. Uh, you know, like <laughs> look at me, I'm on stage at Carnegie Hall. Well, what was great was when they sent us the rider, right. you know, that we had to sign off on, and said, you know, the only people that could take pictures would be registered journalists. Right. We had one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. We said, uh, we called him up and like, listen, you got to go to this show and shoot everything. Right. Uh, and, but if he, whatever he shot, he had to shoot from way back. So he brought one of those like NASA right. lenses <laughs> and he was back there just taking pain. And I was just so happy. Yeah. <laughs> happy about that. That's cool. Um, I read something that said at the time you were the only artist to play Carnegie Hall without a record out. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, that's insane that you can get to that level, you know? I mean, it took a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, ba basically, you know, that was, it. they were doing some renovations, so they had open dates. Right. And it was like, well, you can do this, but you have to do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And right. it was like, okay. And uh, our manager put in a tremendous amount of legwork, and right. it, it, all the clubs were helping to promote it and stuff, yeah. so it was nice. And then you sold it out. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, where do you, and then do you ever ha get the feeling of like, all right, where do we go from here now that we've done that? No. No. You just keep <laughs> trucking. <laughs> no. It's all good. It doesn't, you know, even to this day, like we just did a party in East Brunswick. Right. It was a guy's birthday party, 50th birthday party. Beautiful property, two acres, Olympic swimming pool in the backyard. And we were supposed to play outside Friday. Right. But it was raining. Mm -hmm. So they moved the entire thing into his living room. Right. And we played in somebody's living room on the corner of the living room next to the fireplace. And he had about uh, 60 people there. Right. And we had the time of our life. That's awesome. And it's just, it doesn't matter if, if we've played to, we, we, I remember playing at the uh, at Kenny's Castaways in the village. Yeah. 12 right. people were there. Right. And because it was so ridiculous that only 12 people were there. Right. We played the best show we ever did. That's cool. Because then you're just playing off of the silliness of it right and just you know how how hard can i rock to a room that's empty <laughs> right. let's find out right and, and, and yeah it's so it awesome. doesn't matter if it's that or if there's a thousand people yeah. or if we're playing to a crazy drunk crowd uh, you know uh, somewhere down the shore right or if we're playing in a township event where there's nobody under the age of 60 and they right. have their chairs all yeah, right. set up and they're just sitting there watching you play right. everything from Poison to Frank Sinatra <laughs> right. it's all 
like it. That's pretty funny. That's cool. I mean, it's that is cool because one of the most memorable shows I've ever been to was a band playing in front of like five people, and you would have thought they were like playing the sold out garden. Like they rock so hard. It yeah. was And you never forget it. It was like a cool thing. Right. Yeah. So I'm and sure you, and, you, and you respect them a lot more. Totally. Of that. Right. It's like, look at what these guys think. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Because I went into it thinking, oh, these guys are gonna like. They're gonna be like, "F this! P- play one song and get out of here," right. you know. And then they they probably played longer than they typically do. You yeah, know? and they were having fun. <laughs> and it's funny because <laughs> we've been in the situation where the where the manager has come over and said, uh, "You know, if you want to wrap it up at one o'clock, right?" And there's hardly anybody there. Like, <laughs> now we're gonna go to one thirty, right? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you gotta let, it, we're gonna go to one thirty whether you like it or not. You're right. gonna stay here, and your staff is gonna stay. Here. Right. That's pretty funny. But, uh, yeah, just like, oh, really? All right, well, we're just going to play our hearts out right. even more. So who would you credit with turning your band into a business early on? Was that something you kind of grabbed the reins on? Was your manager helpful? No, it was helpful? our manager. Yeah. It was, it was, everything was our manager. He, he just, he'd been in the business forever. Mm-hmm. He played on a lot of records. He played drums on Build Me Up Buttercup and all, ki- all kinds of other, not, not Build Me Up, but yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, more today than yesterday. Right. Uh, all kinds of disco records. So anyway, he'd been he'd been there for a while. So he was like, "Oh, we got to do this. We right. got to do this." And we're like, "Really? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I got to set you up with this guy. He's going to talk about, you know, setting up a a four hundred one k or this or that." Right. And I'm like, all right, you know. Right. And uh, you know, we were still so young in our heads, even though we were in our late twenties. But you know, we uh, okay, whatever you say. Right. And uh, next thing you know, you know, um, guy's sitting there with me. Said, you know, uh, our financial advisor. Yeah, right. financial <laughs> advisor. You know, you should buy a house. I'm like, really? I, I should buy a house? Right. I'm 30 years old? I don't, isn't that something adults do? Right, right. No, you should really buy a house. You can afford it. I'm like, um, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> it's like that. It like that. We were like so young and dumb in our heads right. even at that age uh-huh. but we just couldn't get our could never get our arms around the fact the idea that this is what this is what our career is right, right. now this is what we're doing for a living yeah so did you ever have in the back of your mind still at that time like I gotta think about what my job's gonna be or did you kinda ride it as long as you could no, and next thing you know you're no no yeah yeah we just kinda yeah. kept, and it just got ridiculous and then it was like wow this, this is fantastic right and 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 it, and it peaked, and then it dropped off a little bit, but it's still here. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's like, wow, I can't believe right. we've played through. For, for, first of all, through all of these musical trends. Right. I mean, I'm I'm 60 years old. Right. I've had to reinvent my what I call contemporary music liking stuff. Yeah. Again and again and again, right. starting with the B52s. Right. You know. B fifty twos. I was like, "What is this garbage?" Right. And then I loved it more than anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it was all the hair bands and oh, what is this? And then I, and again and again and again. Right. That stopped about five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, I feel like a lot of that, like you know, like you said, that eighties, nineties, two thousands, like to me is like one of the golden ages of like at least yeah. rock music, yeah, especially and, and you know? the grunge, yeah. you know, and and that whole thing. And right. if that's what you wanted to. To, to like and everything that came from that and yeah. then that was that was it right <laughs> yeah it's like a friend wild. of mine who's a DJ said you know uh, the, the the rough part about being in a band now is that there's no songs there's no music <laughs> right I'm like well sure I guess yeah because you know. you've written through those trends too where there was like you know synthesizers became big and like guitars right. were uh, the, you know there's no more guitars in bands and then they're down and then it's like guitars are back and you know yeah yeah it's pretty intense um, because think of how many bands have come and gone since you've been doing this right you know like the guys who made the record thousands right yeah. yeah totally you know but as a cover band you're still responsible for to keep that right you know that fire going I, yeah. I guess is the best way to put it right so do you um, are you real involved in song selection or is it like a band kind of decision <coughs> no it's it, well it's it, you know the band will throw some ideas out there mm. Uh, and then you know we'll we'll try some stuff. Right. You know we throw away you know three out of every six songs that we learn. Right. Uh, but uh, I I we have such a good read 
on the crowd. I mean, we, we never have a song, a set list. Right. We have a catalog of 300, 400 songs that we've ever played and right. some that we can fake. And, uh, and through the course of any given night, I'll, I'll call it. Right. And that's the nice thing about the way that we have things set up is it's, it's not about ego. It's about getting the job done. Mm-hmm. So I just look at my guys and say, we're going to play this now. And they all go, okay, and, right. and play it because they know it's not to please me. It's just right. to please the show. Right. It's like, damn it, Jim's calling out the B-52s again, man. What's with this guy? <laughs> What's this obsession with the B-52s? <laughs> right. He used now to we're, hate them, man. Now we're learning Russian songs. He's going to start speaking Russian any second. That's right. So uh, do you guys still do you put in a lot of time to rehearsing, or are you gigging so much that gigs are your rehearsal? Basically? We gig so much that we re- actually rehearse maybe two, three times a year. Wow. Yeah. Right. And some of the stuff we just... Like, like, you know, there's some songs I just email them to everybody. Right. And uh, that's a whole other conversation. But I just email, email them to everybody. Just learn this and we'll try it Wednesday. Right. And everybody learns it and we try it Wednesday. And by the, by the time the weekend is there, we have a pretty good handle uh, on it. That's cool. And then it's in the set. Right. So the you other, work you know, the, the other thing that I said, other story, is technology. Uh, in the time that we've been around, when right. we started, there – home computing was yeah. marginal. You guys had to like go out and buy CDs to figure out songs yeah. or listen to the radio yeah. or something. And I had to make mixtapes for right. everybody and physically hand them. And, right. and, and you know, we had to call people on the phone to say, oh, this is the time the gig is. And then we had a fax machine and a, ooh, right. fax machine and a, and a computer. I remember my wife and girlfriend at the time saying, uh, you know, you should get a computer. Like, mm-hmm. why? Right. why? What's that? <laughs> what is this computer you speak of? Uh-huh. And uh, it's so that, and then that, that whole thing, just the culture of technology in the time. Right. So we went from handing out things to then, oh, here, I burned you a CD. Right. Or you could play this in your car yeah. uh, or on your computer. Right. And, uh, and then just MP3s. Yeah. Oh, here, uh, I emailed you a <laughs> song. Right. right. And where, where's the lyrics? Oh, here. And how do I play this part? Here's a YouTube video. Wow, yeah. And just like, this is too easy yeah, now. it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, even your whole business as a band back then. I mean, you probably mailed a mixtape to Kenny's Castaways to get that gig, you know. Oh, yeah. Big um, fat VHS. Right. You know? Had a notebook out for people to write down their name and address <laughs> right? yep. to build your mailing list. Yep. And, yeah. It's crazy. And the whole website thing, that was a whole other thing, too. Right. Because... Uh, some of our fans were these really nerdy guys from uh, Bricktown, mm. and they come up. To, they came up to me at, at the at the trade winds in like nineteen ninety four. Right. And they go, oh, we're going to build you a web page. Right. I'm like, that's nice. Right. What's a web page? Right, right. Oh, well, it's like this. It's like this. You know, it's like a newsletter thing. Like, all right, right. Well, you, you go do that. Right. And, and then they go, all right, all right, here's what it is. It's this domain name. It's about a mile long. <laughs> right. and you have to type it all in. And, and then it, it shortened over time and shortened until right. it was finally at the dash nerds right. dot com. That's cool. But uh, that was all somebody else doing it for us. And we were, and we were just sitting there going like, uh, yeah, whatever. Right. Sure, we'll have a website. <laughs> yeah. and, and we probably have one of the first websites for a band, you know. Right. And, it's great. That's wild. That's really cool. Um, so you you bought. Someone told you to buy a house back then, and I guess it it created an interest in real estate for you. Uh, no, no, actually, the interest in real estate was always there because right. my 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 entire family were builders in okay. one form or another, and my mother always used to say, "Why why don't you buy a house and fix it and sell it?" You know, I keep telling your father, but he doesn't want to do that. My right. father. My father, God bless him, he was just he was just happy that he was in America and had a job and right. was supporting a family with an apartment in Hoboken that at the time, at the most, was $60 a month. Wow, that's <laughs> can't wild. Buy, you can't get a parking space for a day for $60 right. a month in Hoboken. Right, right. We were living there. Uh, so, yeah, my mom was always, oh, you, got, you should do this. And some of my uncles, oh, yeah, well, do this, do this. And it was always, so it was always kind of there. Right. And then in the last couple of years, you know, I, I've said, you know, maybe I, I should do that. I, right. I'm certainly capable. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, the right network of people and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So what, uh, 
So what do you do? Do you flip houses now? I'm, I haven't done one yet, no. but I'm just starting to get into it now. I've, right. been, I've been talking to a lot of people, including Brian Kirk, uh-huh. who is notorious for doing that. Right. And uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get into that business. So you're researching. Now. and Yeah, yeah. because uh, it's, it's, it's a risk that I can sort of manage. Right. And we'll see. We'll yeah. learn from it. It'll either work or it, it, it won't work, you know. Right. So any particular areas you're looking at or anything? I'm, you know, I'm looking at where I know. So, right. you know, looking around Freehold. Right. Uh, I'm supposed to get together with Brian and go to one of those auctions okay. that they have at the sheriff's office and see how that all plays out. Right. Stuff like that. And, that, and I've been thinking of, uh, we've been trying to sell our home to move down to Barnegat. Okay. Uh, so maybe something in the Tom's River area or something like that. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Um, do you have a goal, like what you want to do with it? With, with house with, flipping? Yeah. Like, do you want to start out with a particular type of project, or what are you thinking? Well, you know, it would be nice to start out with a lipstick on a pig project. Right, right. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and just, just to learn the process, uh-huh. you know, and the paperwork, and the, what you have to do, and the timing factor. Right. And then go into stuff, you know, beyond that, and maybe even uh, some uh, income properties, right. or rental properties. That's cool. So do you think you would do some of the work yourself, like in the initial projects? Yeah. yeah. You still have those uh oh, I still have chops. all the tools. Yeah. I have every tool that there is. Do you really? Yeah. My wife doesn't understand why. Right. But, you know, that's the guy. That's the guy that I am. Right. I'm that guy. Uh-huh. The guy with a garage full of garage tools and then a whole other set of carpentry and right. construction tools. And that's that. cool. Do you yeah. do work around your house? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you have a whole set of uh, what's your band set up like at home? Do you play? Do you have like a I have a nice finished basement uh-huh. <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a full band set up, which right. I have two sons. Okay. They've grown up knowing nothing other than my father's a musician in a band that seems that everybody, in, including my teachers, know about. Right. That's, that's a whole other thing that, you know, I have to sit back sometimes and I have to think, like, what do they think? Like, right. like what, what is life in their mind? Right. You know, when we'll be walking through the mall and somebody come. oh, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to say, you guys are great, and I've seen you in this and this. And I mean, just looking at me, just deal with this very casually and, right. and happily. How old are your kids? Well, now they're 20 and 25. Okay. My older son, Evan, uh, works with the nerds. Okay. He, he's on the crew. He does lights. He sets up back line, and he spent a year in Nashville studying recording engineering. Oh, did he? And then interning at a studio there. That's cool. Loved it would love to do nothing but that right but he also has a band so getting back to the basement so he has a band called jack uh-huh. uh they're playing basically the same music that the nerds are playing right the difference is they're all 25 years old wow. so it's an interesting there's like a dichotomy there because you have people watching them who are their age but they're playing their parents music right and and it seems like it's catching on because there's like an appreciation for that now. Right. Like a lot of younger people are now accepting live music and classic rock ish stuff. Right. By classic rock, I'm talking 90s. Yep. You know. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Uh, but they're seeing that and they're going, oh, okay, well, this is, this is not just a DJ. Right. This is an alternate, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they're playing. They're actually playing this Saturday night at Jenks. Oh, that's cool. So really excited about that. They played at the Parker House a couple of times over the summer and nice. a whole bunch of places. Uh, so, yeah, so that's my basement is Studio Ground Zero for Nerds and, and Jack, Jack Band. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys ever done a gig together? Yeah, yeah, we did yeah. quite a few. Yeah, Yeah, we, cool. we had them open for us at a couple of places. They played at Joe Pops. They played at Jenks with us. Nice. Uh, yeah. That's really cool. What's he play? He plays drums. Okay. He's, he studied piano for five or eight years I don't remember right and then guitar dabbled and then got into the drums and that's that's his right now. that's cool and then my younger son uh, uh, he uh, also wants to be an, a recording engineer but more from a producer standpoint in fact right. I was going to try to bring him here just to see this right uh, but he's all about that he's all about creating music on the computer and mm-hmm. had friends come over and record tracks Sometimes three or four o'clock in oh, the really? morning, right. and it's but fortunate, you know, they they have uh, headphones, uh, so right. <laughs> it's all good. That's cool. So has he been working in a studio, uh, or is he just kind of learning on te- 
and teaching himself. No, no, he he uh, he took a course here in Jersey right. on, on recording engineering. That's cool. That for about six months. Right. And now he's just uh, waiting to find a job. Yeah. Doing that. Right. Uh, he went to Rutgers for for a year, thinking that he would like to be a mechanical engineer. Wow. Uh, very bright kid, but it was an overwhelming reality for right. him. And he said, oh, I don't think I want to do this. Right. I think I want to do audio. Yeah. Right. Okay, good luck. <laughs> that would be my call, <laughs> that's for sure. Even though I have no audio recording skills, but it sounds a lot more pleasurable than uh, the other kind of engineering, mm -hmm. especially in the coursework, right? Yeah. yeah. It won't pay as well, but right. you, know, you got to be happy. So does he record any nerds gigs or anything like that? Have you tried them, tried them out? Nope. No, no, he's got his own music. Right. That has nothing to do with it. What kind of music <laughs> is he into? He's He does a lot of this atmospheric like ambient, ambient electronic yeah, type yeah, 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 of, that's yeah. cool not dancey stuff but just this ambient electronic oh, that's cool. kind of stuff it's like I, I like it I, right. it's just not what I do right. it, but it, it's interesting because my older son is all about what I do and then but his own music is that just this uh, hardcore metal <laughs> stuff <laughs> right. but that's his music and he realizes that it's his uh -huh. music not everybody is going to like it. Right. But so he plays what he plays in the jack band. That's cool. Uh, so he's like a double bass pedal kind of guy. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Right. Very talented. Uh, That's cool. My younger son wants nothing to do with the nerds. Or right. The, and it's not, not out of anything. It's just that's yeah. that's the guy that he is. You that's know? cool. It's just interesting to sit back and watch. Like, how, you know. That's awesome. How they go. And my wife is fantastic and just tolerates everything right wonderfully whether it's the loud noise or the crazy hours or me listening to hindu music so she doesn't work in the in the the business at all no not, not at all she is a life coach specializing in quit and uh, quit smoking oh really That's and cool. uh, she's had tremendous success with that and I and, saw and it. Loves yeah. it. I, I was wondering you had like a quit smoking thing on the nerds yeah. website so that's why that's my wife cool um did you smoke at one point no i never did no nah. did she so how did she get into that she smoked she did she smoked and then she took this program she tried you know 20 other ways they all failed she did this one program and it worked like a charm right. she never smoked again so she took that program modified it and made some uh, you know built off of that to right. create her own program that's cool and it's it's really amazing because yeah. there are people there's there's a girl who smoked for 40 years wow. and within 10 days non-smoker that's and awesome. that was a year and a half ago and she still won't smoke that's cool and she didn't put on 50 pounds right she didn't do all those things that people are afraid of quitting smoking right she looks healthier and thin Feels same better. Shape. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah it's cool yeah um law school is where i started smoking and it used to be like you'd you'd get a break halfway through class and like first week of school there'd mm -hmm. be like three people outside smoking like second week of school six people <laughs> by the time like finals were coming up it was like the entire class was outside smoking, and the professor right? yeah, it's totally, <laughs> yeah it was totally insane so my tactic to quit smoking was i studied for the bar exam on a porch and i was watching like bar review tapes like on an ipad and chain smoked the entire time because I was so stressed out, like I'm gonna F this up and it's gonna be this, you know. I was I already talked myself out of like I'm gonna pass the bar exam. And I was thinking of all the bad things that are gonna happen. Oh, you can't take it for another six months and then sure. you can't work and then blah, 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 you know, a million things. So I'm chain smoking the entire time. And I was finally the day I took the bar exam, I told myself I'm gonna quit smoking. And I was so sick of smoking, like I, I couldn't even look at another cigarette because I can't even think of how many I smoked like studying for the bar exam. It was oh, insane. Wow. Yeah. But so her, her path would have been probably better for me. <laughs> well, you know, it, uh, her path employs a lot of things like that. It, right. You know, it, it employs cognitive uh, things. It, 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 you know, it, it's somewhere between Clockwork Orange and uh, Weight Watchers. <laughs> right. You know, it's somewhere in between there. <laughs> right. uh, but it works. It's, uh, it's interesting. That's and, really cool. And for her, it's so fulfilling because, you know, she'll get letters from people like right. months later. Oh, my God, you changed my life. You're an angel, this and that. And the other. You know, it's like, that's good. That's cool. Is she going to develop like a stop vaping program now? <laughs> that might be a good one, that, too. That we'll see because right. uh, my older son is the expert on everything about vaping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, when you're an expert... You know it all. Right. 
Yeah. So there, there are conflicting discussions at, at my dinner table. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so is he allowed to vape in the, uh, the basement studio? No, he goes There's outside. a band from the house he there. Goes outside, That's cool. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, the nerds, I thought you were uh, wrapping up for the summer, and then I peeked at your website. You got like an insane number of gigs coming up, and I mean that's the thing I would touch on is like real quickly about you guys is like people probably think like oh that's a sweet gig you get to play music for a living, and but you guys work legitimately hard. Like if you look at some of your gigs, like you have days where you're doing like two gigs a day. I mean I'm sure you have experience where you've done yeah, more. Just, in fact, every Saturday this past summer right. was a double. That's insane. So I mean you guys are definitely like you work hard, uh, obviously. Um, but some upcoming gigs, uh, September 13th, you'll be at the place in New City. Uh, the 20th, you're at the Hard Rock in AC mm-hmm. for 6 o'clock show. Have you played the new Hard Rock down there yet? Several times. Yeah, yeah. how is it? It's funny. Yeah. It's funny because right. it's Atlantic City. Right. So that's the crossroads of every freak. Right. That, you know. <laughs> that's and, uh, and you see what goes on sometimes. It's like there was a guy dancing uh, – couple of times that we were there who literally looked like he just walked out of area 51 wow uh he looked like a space alien right and he was just having the time of his life right (laughs) just like and the bouncers were like uh do we do we move him out of the room what right but no it's it's great and i love you know the hard rock is it's a cool place sure it's a cool place yeah um any what's the craziest experience you've encountered over the years at a gig (laughs) or after a gig you know what? Thirty-four years. There's been so many. Right. Uh, I, I can't even remember, but there've been memorable things like Bon Jovi showing up mm. at the Joe Pops, That's and that cool. was that was a very cool thing. And here's why: right. I'll make it brief. Uh, he was there, and he had his people with him over by the side bar. And I went over, introduced myself. And he goes, "Oh man, I know everything about you," and he spouted out everything about my band, right, past and present. And I was like, "Wow, that's really something." Uh, John, you want to get up? Would you, would you would you get up and do a song with us? <laughs> right. He's like, I'd love to, but can we do it later? Because I want to hang out all night. Right. Sure, that's even nicer. Right. And then uh, midway through the last set, okay, I got him up. He did want it dead or alive. No. I... By that time, from the time that I, I got there to he got up on stage, the population of Joe Pops quadrupled because everybody was on their phone. John right. Bon Jovi's here. You got to get up. <laughs> So that was really cool. That's really cool. And, and you know, we've done a lot of th- things like that, you know. A lot of the memorable things have just been who we've played with. Right. We've shared a stage with Cheryl Crow, with Earth, Within Fire, Hootie and the Blowfish, the Go-Go's, Maroon 5, right. Train. And uh, most of them were really nice people. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them were not. <laughs> right. Usually the ones that are not uh, sometimes are the ones that don't stick around too long either. Correct. Right. And then yeah. they're asking you for an opening slot someday. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. Right. But no, there have been some some crazy, crazy moments. Yeah. You know, we, we had a guy come up on stage once who had no legs. No legs. Right. His friends literally just kind of picked him up and put him on the stage at the far stage right. And I'm in the center. And God bless him. The guy crawled over to me with his hands right. and the legs. Comes over to me and, and everybody's watching it, packed house at the Travens. And he comes over and then he like climbs up my leg to hold himself upright. Right. And I look and I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> There's, I can't say anything funny or right. tragic or anything. Just like, uh, okay. okay. Right. And I sang my song with a guy on my leg with wow. no legs. That's wild. That was weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's professionalism. Like, you, you play your song no matter what. It's thrown at you, right? Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Um, all right, September 26th, you're going to be at the Blue Whale House. Um, 29th is one of those double gig days. You're actually going to be at the Staten Island Harley Davidson. Oh, I think they it's love their us there. One year anniversary. <laughs> they love us there. That's sweet. That's, uh, I think that's at 11 a.m. Yeah. at Staten Island Harley, Harley Davidson. And that night you're at Huddy's in Colts Neck. Yeah, that's, that's a great cool. place. So what's the the Harley gig? Uh, is it outside, if it's weather permitting kind of thing? Or it's outside. We, we played their grand opening party. Because, right. you know, when you think of Harley Davidson, you think of the nerds. Totally, yeah. Uh, Plaid, uh, <laughs> hardly wear, plaid right? Right, so, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it went, so we played in the rain, in uh, the drizzle the whole time. Right. But, but everybody stayed and loved it. Didn't right. care. 
and then they called us uh, two weeks ago to play their anniversary party and that's like, cool I'd love to do it I'm, I'm a Harley guy myself oh, I yeah? a couple of bikes and what that's do what got? I do the rest of the time okay uh, that's how you unwind like when you're not gigging yeah, go for uh, a ride it's fantastic it's wonderful what do you have I have a road king mm-hmm. and a uh, fat bob wow and my wife rides too she's got her own bike oh really she got her license and everything and that's cool. We have some good times. It's so nice. you have a favorite place to go ride? You know what? There's Monmouth County is just beautiful mm. because one second you're here like in a shore town with businesses and main streets. Right. And five minutes later you're driving, you're riding past farms and horses and and hills and curvy roads. Right. And it's, it's great. So we go all over the place. That's we'll, cool. We'll, we'll sometimes head all the way down through Rumson and go down to Woody's and Seabright and have something to eat, go right. back, or we'll go out to like Allentown. There's all these back roads to take right. to Allentown, New Jersey. That's stuff cool. like that, you right. know, short rides or, or New Hope, uh-huh. Pennsylvania and stuff like that. That's cool. Ever ride the gigs? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did a couple of with Matawan and one in Freehold too that I just rode I'll meet you there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I can't read. There's some band I just saw. It was a documentary about them and one member of the band used to, oh, you know who it was? Was it, uh, it's Neil Pert and Rush. Like he used to ride like in like hundreds of miles between gigs and stuff. Mm-hmm. It was wild. Yeah, he wasn't. It wasn't riding a Harley. It was more like a some kind of like BMW road bike or something. Sure. But he used to ride like intense rider on tour. It was wild. It's uh, you know it it really does something for your head. Yeah. Because it forces you to focus tremendously. So unless you're really good at meditation, tra- at TM like my wife is. Right. Uh, the bike is a nice alternate. Right, because it when you have to have that much focus to keep from getting killed, yeah, because everybody's trying to kill you. I don't totally. know if you know that. I do. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it's great. Right, you're right. It is that was my when I wasn't smoking cigarettes, um, I was riding a motorcycle in law school. That's what oh, I did. Nice. I would just go out. I wasn't a Harley, but I would uh, go hit the road for like even half hour. Some just go for a ride in the country yeah. kind of thing. It was Opens cool. you up, clears yeah. you out. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Um, We're also doing. Let me let me uh, bring up uh, the Mammoth uh, Racetrack Rock Fest. Oh, really? When's that? I don't know. Okay. Let me tell you in a second. Check uh, out uh, the dash nerds dot com with some gigs coming up. Um, I didn't notice that one. That's uh, Saturday, the September twenty eighth. Okay. At Mammoth Park, um, and what is it? It's uh, a whole bunch of bands. Okay. Uh, playing, uh, it's, it's a basically a fundraiser for a Habitat for Humanity type of organization, uh, cool. HAB, and uh, so it's a good cause, and it's a lot of really great bands. There, there are a lot of bands that that play in a really tight circuit, and they're very wa- they're very well known around, say here, Cold Snack, you know, this part of Monmouth County, right? Who are so talented that they put to shame a lot of bands that are out there making a really good living. Right. Uh, so that's, we're, 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 we're playing, with, they're letting us play with them. Oh, uh, that's cool. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, check that out at Mammoth Park on the 28th. Um, once again, check out the dash nerds.com. Follow the Nerds Band uh, on Instagram at the Nerds Band. And Facebook. And Facebook. Uh, we tagged you on Facebook here, so you can find it there. Uh, Jim, really appreciate you coming in. Um, quick shout out to Marissa Goldman at Innovation Title. She's actually coming up next. So oddly enough, I was introduced to you uh, from a title person, of course. Why <laughs> isn't that how you meet bands all the time? Mm-hmm. Uh, but thanks to Marissa for putting us in touch and uh, yeah. helping make this happen. I appreciate you coming awesome. in. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Once again, I'm Evan Balmer. Follow me on Instagram at Evan Balmer uh, and look for the Mullet Cast on Facebook. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>